G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for the round 18 round review. Uh, apologize that it's a little bit late, uh, a day later than I would like to have had it out for you guys, but the truth is I've been a sick boy. I woke up at 7 a.m. yesterday to watch the Eagles and I was just fevering hard. I think I picked up some sort of Croatian flu um, and yeah, was in a pretty gross state yesterday. So I uh, decided to spend most of the day um, sleeping and I'm still not 100% today, but uh, I'm going to have a crack at talking about round 18, uh, largely just because I thought it was a super interesting round um, with, you know, the season, the finals race this year is kind of blown open a little bit. Uh, other than maybe say the bottom four teams, obviously West Coast, North Melbourne, Hawthorne and even Fremantle now are probably the four teams you'd say can't really make finals. But other than that, you you know, there were teams that were in the bottom four, you know, one week or two weeks ago that are still kind of in the finals race. It's probably one of the most open finals races I can remember for some time. So we're going to talk about a pretty eventful round 18 that had major implications on the top eight. If you could do me a favor before we get into the video, um, obviously True Footy is working in partnership with AFL Game Day Squad and I do make a Game Day Squad video each week updating you on how my team is going. So essentially it's an alternative to AFL Fantasy and Supercoach where you can compile your own team using footy cards. It works as a sort of dynasty league. So the players that you accumulate now, let's say if you end up with a young Jasper Fletcher or Will Ashcroft, you keep those players into future seasons as well. So with True Footy, we've got our own competition running as well. So if you want to head down into the link in the description, you can click and join the league. It's all completely free. We've got about 132 in the league at the moment, um, and you'll really be helping me out if you make a team and get stuck into the action and uh, follow along with the videos that I make each week on my team and how they're going. Appreciate if you took the time to do that, but otherwise, let's get into round 18. So the round kicked off between Sydney and the Bulldogs, where Sydney got the job done by a couple of points, and this one was a really hard game to pick. I'm pretty sure I got my tip right of Sydney in the end, but at one point I definitely had the Bulldogs as my tip. And Sydney are again one of these teams who are sort of up and down each week and still find themselves strangely in the finals race. It was an interesting sort of game. You know, Sydney didn't pick a recognized ruck. I think they had guys like uh, Logan McDonald, McLean, uh, Amadi as their rucks and Tim English got the better of them as you'd expect, but they did okay. They were also missing a couple of clearance players in Chad Warner and Angus Sheldrick. So the Bulldogs, as you'd expect, as a strong midfield really sort of dominated the clearances and Tim English ended up having 60 hit outs and 10 clearances which is wild. Tom Libertore also was quite dominant. The Dogs won the clearance battle 52 to 34 but Sydney's ground ball game was very very impressive and in the end recorded a two-point victory off the back of Tom Papley kicking four goals as well. Errol Golden probably is starting to cement himself as Sydney's best player. We were all missed at that point, I think. He had 30 disposals, 11 inside 50s, 770 odd metres gained, and pretty much firming himself as an All-Australian player this year at the age of just 20. And bizarrely, Sydney are 14th on the ladder right now, and are probably still one of those teams that could make the finals, but we've got some serious contenders that we'll talk about uh, later in this video. Then you had game of the round, and this is probably still game game of the year for me, actually. Um, Essendon versus Port um, a while ago. That was a few weeks ago. That was the game of the year at the time, but I think that was certainly the best finish with Dan Houston's after the siren goal. But I think in terms of the implications of this year, Melbourne v Brisbane, you know, what was it? Third versus fourth. Melbourne in a bit of a slump. The Lions trying to prove themselves as a genuine contender at the MCG. Seven minutes to go. The margin is 25 points. This for me was game of the year in terms of the implication and the effect it's going to have on the finals race. So as I said, seven minutes to go, 25 points is the margin. The Lions have been dominant for a couple of quarters, you'd have to say. It was a weird topsy-turvy game where Melbourne had a big lead and then the Lions had a big lead and the game looked just about over. Jake Melkshin steps up to the plate, kicks two difficult set shots to win the game. And Melbourne continue to demonstrate themselves as this side, sort of like Collingwood in the sense that they've got this spirit where they're never fully out of the game. And that's what makes them dangerous as a premiership contender as far as I'm concerned. They've got that killer instinct, they've got that never say die attitude and they're still, despite the fact that the Lions were arguably the better side of the night, the fact that Melbourne came from the clouds to pinch this game makes them very, very dangerous. For the Lions, this will have implications on uh, you know their top two chances and also again like a demonstrated ability to win at the MCG. We know that they beat them in the finals last year. Their form at the MCG has been a question mark and you know obviously they went down to the Hawks by something like five goals a few weeks back but to lose in that manner in a finals like atmosphere um, that will be frustrating for them and instead of being you know three games ahead of Melbourne like they would have been they now sit just one game ahead of them. Having said that though 
You know, the fact that they lost the game all in seven minutes at the end there, to me, I do feel a bit more confident about their ability to play at the MCG, but it's a weird trend where their best performance have, have only come against Melbourne. Like, you put them against Hawthorne, and Hawthorne will almost run rings around them. But nonetheless, you know, the fact that they didn't get the four points, I still think we saw enough out of Brisbane on the MCG to feel a little bit more confident about them, and there were times through this game where they really, really looked dangerous. One of the other big takeaways from this game was Max Gorn's form as the sole ruck. Obviously, Grundy's been sent back to the VFL to work on his forward craft, has been much has been said about that obviously they've just recruited him on a was it a five-year deal but Max Gorn pulls out one of the best games uh, maybe not of his career because he's had such a good career but certainly his best performance of the season 39 hit outs 29 disposals a long range goal 10 clearances you can certainly make the case that you know maybe Gorn as a single ruck actually makes Melbourne a better team Petrarca is another player I want to mention here he had four goals and 26 possessions and almost gets swept under the rug a little bit certainly we're talking about some of the best performed midfielders this year and I feel like Petrarca's name hasn't been coming up in that conversation either but when you consider that Clayton Oliver has spent a little bit of time out of this side now there's a chance that he's been accumulating some Brownlow votes and he's second in the coaches votes right now he's such a dangerous player and one of those players that's just a live wire you can play him forward he'll impact the contest he'll hit the scoreboard you could genuinely pick him on the all-australian forward line just one of those players bizarrely or perhaps it's just my perception that hasn't been talked about enough for having a very good season collingwood then beat Fremantle by 46 points at the mcg on saturday morning um, in one of the more predictable results of this weekend obviously Fremantle's form hasn't been great i did talk them up as a sneaky chance but evidently i got that wrong and Fremantle really are a shell of their previous form you know on top of being kicked out of the finals now or at least i certainly don't really give them a chance i don't know what the maths is on that but sean darcy went down with an ankle in this game brandon walker's done a knee it was a bit of a nail in the coffin at moment for Fremantle this year, though you could say, you know, getting blitzed by Carlton last week um, probably had the same impact. Fremantle did challenge them early. I think they were winning uh, the clearances 16 to 6 in the first term, which is kind of impressive when you consider Sarong wasn't playing, uh, but you had, you know, Brayshaw step up as he, as he so often does. Jago O'Meara was another player that really step, stepped up with 30 possessions, 10 clearances. Neil Erasmus also 26 touches and 5 clearances. It's good to see a young player with talent start to make an impact at AFL level. But Collingwood are obviously the most dangerous team in the competition and I think it was a 10 goal second term 86 to 33 at halftime and the game's been completely killed off and obviously Nick Dacos it goes without saying was one of the best players on the ground with 36 touches and a goal Fremantle's forward entries also was another problem for them as it has been you know throughout the last handful of years and it really allowed someone like Darcy Moore to just take interstate marks at will I think he took like five in the first term or something like that so we know he's obviously one of the best players in his position but it was the sort of game where Fremantle kind of made it easy for the Pies and they rack up a big win but the telling stat for me here is that Fremantle won the clearances 46 to 40 and generated just 35 inside 50s which is West Coast levels. Then Stephen King's Gold Coast Suns got the job done over St Kilda by 26 points in a pretty one-sided affair and sort of really demonstrates St Kilda's continual slide down the ladder this year and somehow I think they're still sixth on the ladder but they feel a long way off being the sixth best side in this competition and looks like finals is getting less and less likely for them. St Kilda's pressure level is completely off as it has been for a little while now and from the opening bounce you could felt like Gold Coast were playing very carefree footy lots of playing on we saw a potentially career best performance from Sam Flanders I think he had 33 touches he was a player that started the preseason really well didn't quite make that impact at AFL level throughout the season but again like I said probably had a career best game the Suns dominated contested possession as they so often do they out tackled St Kilda quite a lot as well despite having more of the footy and their clearance game in particular 40 to 27 is one of the reasons they got the better of the Saints Will Powell's also fantastic in this game 26 and 30 13 intercepts. Rory Atkins had a day out with a couple of goals and 31, I think. Jack Lacoche has kicked four goals. So we have seen a Jekyll and Hyde Gold Coast this year, like so many other teams. I feel like I'm saying that about a whole host of teams, and this was the Gold Coast Suns at their best. The Saints got beaten in most aspects of this game, and we do acknowledge their forward line woes at the moment. Max King, Jack Higgins, Tim Membry, but their, their ball use and their, their general ball movement going inside 50 was really poor, in addition to that lack of pressure that I mentioned. They had just 13 shots at goal in this game, and I think three of the last four games they've only kicked eight goals so the ability to hit the scoreboard for Saints continues to be a problem. The Suns are still kind of in the finals race. They've got a big trip next week to Canberra to play GWS. GWS don't play well at Canberra. And despite GWS's form at the moment, you think that's a handy game, probably a mini final. The loser of that game is probably out of the finals race. Then we had probably one of the biggest results this weekend. Carlton smashed Port Adelaide, a result that I did not see coming. And we know that the Blues have had this little bit of resurgence. This was their test to play against one of the better teams in the competition after beating up on some easy sides. And they played with that same tenacity and that same dominance, particularly 
from stoppages. They had some injury issues. Obviously, Mackay getting injured in this game is being talked about a lot. We're still unsure on the extent of that injury, but we're hopeful that it was just a precautionary subbing and he might only miss a couple of weeks. But outside of that, the, the Blues really did a good job of finding other avenues to go. In particular, Motlop, who was a late in, kicks four goals in the first half. Silvani kicked four goals. Kerno kicked three goals. They're still attacking weapons for the Blues, particularly when their midfielder is winning that battle. It's a weird resurgence here from the Blues. They went one and eight between rounds five and 13, and now suddenly look like one of the form sides of the competition. The Power snapped their 13 game winning streak. I don't think I'm gonna to read too much into this performance, even though it was pretty lackluster, but I feel like that lackluster performance was coming and is expected when a team is on such a winning streak. They did have something like seven changes for this game as well. So there's a bit of lack of synergy perhaps, and understandably a bit of fatigue. And they are coming against the side that is in red hot form at the moment. There's also something to be said for the fact that Port Adelaide really didn't cruise to a lot of those victories. And I'm not taking away anything from that 13 game winning streak, but they won five of those by seven points or less. And in six of those games, they were trailing in the final term. So understandably, it's probably some fatigue associated with that. They'll have to shake things off quickly because they got the pies in Adelaide late this weekend, which is a potential grand final preview. And for Carlton, they've won four in a row by 50 points or more, and they got West Coast this week. If they do pull out a 50 point win, which you'd probably expect, they'll become the third team in history to ever do that between Geelong in 1989 and Geelong in 2008. Speaking of the Cats, they belted Essendon down at GMHBA, which is not a shock when you consider how good Geelong are at GMHBA Stadium. And it was one of those things where a young a finals aspirant in Essendon faces a major test. The reigning premiers at GMHBA in the form that they're currently in. Geelong have this knack of getting fast starts, particularly against Essendon. It's happened a number of times that they've played in recent years, and they keep the first seven goals of this game to completely kill off the contest. Such was the Cats' dominance that they had 64 to 28 inside 50s, 18 marks inside 50 to just five, and in general, just look like a far better and more experienced side than Essendon, which they are. But we kind of felt this this was coming from the Cats. Their injury list has cleared up a little bit. Someone like Brian Myers has been talked about a lot, but he's having a really strange season. He's just kicked four goals as a small forward, but he's had 30 goal assists and is strangely not completely out of the running for an All-Australian gig, but it's hard to imagine a small forward would get an All-Australian, even in the squad, having kicked just four goals this season. With the Cats have kicked 38 goals in their last two games, this win season moved past Essendon, St Kilda, and the Western Bulldogs all in one round. And while they've got big games against Brisbane, Port, and Collingwood to come, you feel like with the form they're in, they've re-established themselves as a genuine premiership contender. Then Adelaide versus GWS was a really good game and uh, a surprising result to some extent, uh, with the Crows losing by 14 points to the Giants, who have now won five on the bounce, and another one those sides that just clicked into gear randomly in the middle of the season and started to produce finals quality football. The Crows led this game by 17 points at three quarter time. The Giants kicked all of the last five goals of the game to win. Um, and it's sort of reminiscent a little bit of round one where the Giants uh, overcame a 31 point deficit, I believe. And they've continued to demonstrate this knack of being able to beat Adelaide. This thing where teams get the wood on each other, it's a real thing. Sam Taylor was probably one of the most dominant players on the field. He had 21 possessions himself, but also kept Tex Walker, the Coleman medal, you know, favorite uh, to a goalless second half. The Crows were six on the ladder during this game when they were in front. I was looking at the live ladder, they were sixth and having lost this game, they finished the round in 11th spot. Obviously the Crows have had a great season. I think they're really on a nice track in terms of their rebuild and they're still a finals contender for sure, but this was a bit of an eight point game considering where the Giants are on the ladder. And the Crows have a bit of a fortress which they've let slip a little bit with this loss. I hope they've made the finals, I really do. I like watching them play. I think their composure in this game really let them down, in particular in the dying stages. You see Ben Keys miss Rochelle with a simple pass. He kicks it out on the full. There's some other plays in that final field moments where you know Crows players are running into each other. Rochelle loses his call which has been talked about heaps. Overall I think this is one the Crows let slip and as good as the Giants are this is a frustrating result for the Crows. Now as much as we talked about the log jam in the middle of the ladder between teams trying to vie from the eight down the bottom of the ladder you've got this weird mix where the bottom two teams are well below Hawthorne and that was demonstrated again for the second time with Hawthorne getting a 48 point win over North which honestly should have been more. The Roos started the game all right they led for something like 69 seconds and then Hawthorne clicked into gear and they had 25 inside 50s to just four early in the game. They should have put the game to bed, but they ended the first quarter at three goals, eight, didn't score a goal in the second quarter and were three goals, 13 at halftime. The margin was only a goal at halftime, despite the Ruse having 21 less inside 50s. As you'd expect, you know, the, the Hawks being the far superior side, 
pulled away in this game. James Warple had a great game with 32 possessions. Carl Amon was great on the outside. Newcomb, as he so typically is, was good on the inside. I think what was clear in this game was the, the poor skill level by senior players from North Melbourne. And I can say that with conviction being an Eagles fan, but you know, really standout mistakes from Ben Mackay, Luke McDonald, Aiden Core drops a simple mark just outside the goal square uncontested. They're just a team completely devoid of confidence. They should be playing better. I'm going to do a video later this week discussing the whole priority pick situation um, for both North Melbourne and West Coast, but things are looking pretty dire at North. Then saving the best for last, we had West Coast and Richmond at Optus Stadium on Sunday afternoon and the Tigers winning by a pretty regulation 38 points. It honestly felt like it could have been more, particularly early in the game. Richmond had a lot of opportunities. West Coast did an okay job of withstanding them, but still Richmond missed a lot of gettable opportunities in front of goal, fluffs from inside 50s. The Eagles hung tight for large portions of that game. The game was still alive for longer than it probably should have been. There was a few goals either side of halftime where Richmond kicked away, particularly in the third term, opening up something like a 50-point lead. But I suppose what is kind of pleasing as an Eagles fan was that has typically been the point of the game where the Eagles just go home. And thankfully, they played with a really good intensity. They cut the margin back to 38 points. And the intensity and the uh, effort at the contest didn't stop for the entire four quarters, and that's what basically kept it to 38 points. Daniel Rioli was fantastic for the Tigers, particularly off half-back, who's very eye-catching. He had 31 possessions. Dustin Martin as well, having a bit of a resurgence in terms of the way he's finding the footy. I think his last month has been his best ball-winning month since 2019, so he's getting his hands on the footy a little bit more than he has in previous times. And to the Tigers' credit, they are now 5-1 and one since round 12, and again, one of those teams that's still kind of in the finals race. A few weeks ago, they would have been licking their lips at this game, thinking this is a good percentage boost opportunity, but West Coast has kind of improved in the last few weeks and they made them work for it, which is kind of all I can really expect right now. Another player for the Tigers that played quite well was Noah Bolter and his battle with Oscar Allen was really interesting. I don't think Oscar Allen had a touch in the first half or perhaps just one. Bolter was fantastic, quite dominant, but Oscar Allen is such a good player that he was Kennedy-esque in the way that in the second half from limited opportunities, he still found a way to kick three goals. Anyway, guys, that is my take on round 18. Again, sorry that it's a day late. I'm still feeling a bit crook, to be honest. Us, but i um, got to keep working. More videos to come this week. Probably going to be doing my power rankings video this week. Probably going to be doing, uh, obviously, just the tips, my game day squad update, and um, a talk about the priority pick as well. So thanks very much for sticking fat with the channel. Hope you're enjoying the content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video very shortly. Cheers.